Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you know, we've all been aware of Glenn's condition for a while, and I've been kind of aware that there could be a possibility that I'd be asked to speak if need be. And so I was just trying to figure out, well, what should I do? And, uh, you know, I haven't been formally trained and not educated, all that. Become apparent to all of you pretty quick. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, well, I'll use the three pastors we've had here at this church as an example to me. So I thought I'd wear a suit and a tie, talk for two hours about the seven principles of discombobulationalism. <laughs> but before we begin, let's review. <laughs> now, I, it is culturally acceptable to tell a joke to get the speech started, but if, if you're new here, I'm just trying to highlight some of the uh, uh, personality stereotypes of our three pastors. We only have three pastors here, fortunately. And, um, you know, it's, we all, what I kind of made the joke for, though, was to really get us thinking, if we can, even if you don't know the, the why I said that, don't know the three men. Um, we all try to measure God. We all try to come up with ways to think about it. And I think there's, I'm going to say there's two categories of that. One is a very seriously bad one where you're probably trying to misrepresent God, hurt his reputation, steer people away from him. I, I'm afraid many of those people have a very severe encounter with God. However, it doesn't mean they're eternally condemned because I would have put Saul in that category. And I'm going to read some of Paul's writings today. But, um, you know, you're heading down a serious road to um, um, box God in in ways that misrepresent him, like misquote him and so forth. <clears throat> but even on the positive side, I think we all tend to break God down into, uh, you know, intellectually bite-sized pieces for ourselves. And I think it's inevitable, um, you know, our brains think different ways. But what I really hope to do is to get us to think past that. Um, it won't happen today. I mean, as I just mentioned, you know, I'm not a very good speaker, so I really would suggest to you that a lot of what this may mean to you might happen in the weeks or months or a year from now. Um, or you'll just politely endure it for 45 minutes or something. <laughs> but I wanted to talk about grace today. But, you see, I realized that for me, grace is, like, really big. Grace is a lot of things. Grace is why I wasn't eternally separated from God in 1968, first time I did something wrong. You know, grace is why some of you are physically alive today. But some of our brains say, no, grace is a, you know, this, that's mercy, that's redemption, that's justification. You know, you said you're going to talk about grace. Now you're clearly referring to mercy. That's not right. It's the word. So that's the point I'm trying to get us to think about. I think it's an honest thing that we try to break God down into things we can comprehend and understand. But it can also cause us to not grow, I think, sometimes past that point. When we get our thinking points and our talking points just too well established. I think one of the reasons we try to break God down that way also is, frankly, we would just be overwhelmed by him if we did. So we take little chunks of him, and, you know, we just talk about that over and over and over. But my second title, in case grace is going to be a hang-up for a portion of you, is God's behavior towards us. So let's just think about that. 
Um, first of all, I encourage you, if you haven't considered this, I don't want to take anybody's position before God for granted in this room. As we read some of these passages, I want you to consider which side of them you're on. And I want you to consider why did God take action towards us people. Because there was a reason. He didn't just do it for no reason. So, I am going to read a lot of scripture. I encourage you to read it also, either with me. I read so slow, though, you might not be able to do that. You may have to do it at your own pace later on. I'm concerned I'm going to, uh, you know, misstate something, so I definitely encourage you to read it yourself. And I encourage you to read it in further context, and I encourage you to frankly be, allow yourself to be overwhelmed by the concept of God's grace, rather than trying to break it down and figure it out. So let's start in John's Gospel, chapter 3. And for many people, although I'm realizing that I'm old enough now that my culture is changing beneath my feet, but um, you know, most kids my age knew John 3:16, even though they didn't believe it or live it. But I'm aware that you can't really say that in America anymore. So there's a good chunk of our population that does not know this verse. But let's read John 3.16, but let's back up a couple verses, and I'll just start in John 3.14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes may in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's as I reference God's action to us. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. So God's intention in his action to us was not to destroy us, because as we're going to read, we are already in trouble. Verse 18, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not been believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come onto the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. I think this creates a little bit of a division among us people because we see the purpose that God had to take action was that we were guilty and our deeds were in darkness. But we can see God's heart and his motivation and his love. And one of the things that I've come to believe, this is not really scriptural, I'm speaking just from my own intellect here, I kind of believe that love is voluntary. And that makes it even more precious when you receive it. Uh, we all desire it, and so we do lots of things to try to get it. But really, true love is voluntary, I believe. And uh, so if you have love in your life, you know, appreciate that. But I think in light of that, it shows us the value of what God did for us. It doesn't say that, you know, God was kind of trapped by circumstances or um, God had a lot of money invested in mankind, so he cut his losses and did what was best. You know, it says that God loved the world. But I do want you to consider, as, as I wish you would, as we go through a couple more passages, you know, which side of this you're on. Because 
God's action to us has been completed on the cross, but we have to choose to receive or reject. If you would, let's turn over to Romans. I'll start in chapter 3. I certainly encourage you to read all of these in context, and then when you see the little cross-reference things, read those, and when they have cross-references, read those. Like I said, be allow yourself to be overwhelmed by what God has done for us. I'm just going to read 3, 21 through 26. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, here again is a statement of the problem, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time that he, may, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. <coughs> now this is kind of what I was talking about because I guess in my brain I put this whole thing in terms of like grace because God was just so kind to us for all had sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we see in this passage uh, the concept of righteousness. Well, that religion, mankind, the human race, doesn't just uh, ignore that concept. There's many different religious ways that people attempt very hard to become righteous. But what it's saying here is that the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus. To me, that, that's an example of his grace. Uh, maybe some of us are still in the trap of thinking we can, you know, work that out or something like that. Um, justified as well. I mean, we are... Um, down in 26. He might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't say we're justified because, you know, we had rank or we get a lot of wood on the truck and it impressed God. You know, we're justified through his faith, through faith in Jesus. These are the kind of things that I encourage us to just contemplate really what that means. Um, as, a, as a lifetime church kid, I will confess, I, although my attendance was fairly good, I kind of didn't like church a lot. And one of the things I struggled with is how are we going to spend eternity in heaven, you know, just worshiping all the time? Can we go outside some of the time? <laughs> I think what's going to happen is we're going to see this in its fullness. When we sit here now and try to explain becoming the righteousness of Christ, you know, that's why we break it down into categories and words and concepts. Um, it, I mean, it kind of helps. But how do you really explain that? How do we really grasp what we were really saved from? And to whom we were saved to? You know? um, well, I'm struggling with that right now because I would love to sit here for 20 minutes 
and just touch everybody's heart with that passage. But it kind of overwhelms me as well. One of the things I feel we have to realize is that everything we have came through Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to, if I can do it without boring you too much, I just wanted to read the entire chapter 5 of Romans. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how my voice will sound in your ear, so it may be wise to read it yourself later today. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now keep that in mind, peace with God. Verse 2, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through, through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. And so then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. <coughs> For as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. And the law came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. It is sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. wanted to point out some things and I hope that you caught on to some things as well. Right up front, you know, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. As I just said, everything comes through Christ. This is an under, understood concept because right in this chapter, we also see that at one point we were all enemies 
and I think we don't value that, frankly, either. You know, uh, we distance ourselves from God when we chose sin. Uh, we separated ourselves. But through Christ, we have peace with God. Probably one of the reasons we'll praise and worship God forever. Uh, yeah, verse 10 just points out how serious our situation really was. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's the difference that Jesus makes in our life. Without Jesus, we are enemies, we are unreconciled. Through Jesus, we are reconciled, we are saved by his life. <coughs> I'll point out verse 16 to you. Uh, the gift, you know, we, we have this contrast here between sin and <clears throat> salvation, between um, the way through Adam all sin came in and we're all condemned, but through Jesus, uh, the one man, Jesus, we're all saved, or can be saved, I should say. Salvation comes through Jesus. And so in 16, we see that the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on one hand, the judgment arose from the transgression resulting in condemnation. That's where we were at in sin. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. Justification, of course, comes through Christ again. We can't work for it. We can't unsin. We can't volunteer for a lot of civic groups. It just isn't going to happen. Through the one man, Adam, sin came to all of us. We all chose it too, it says, though. But And through the obedience of Christ on the cross, salvation came to us. Um, I encourage you to, you know, as I already have, just stay in these passages. Um, one of the things I guess I really feel as I talk here is that, frankly, it's kind of a, it, it can affect us differently, I think, because some of us, can be reminded to be very thankful um, to have been reconciled to God. And some of us maybe need to really seriously consider whether we have been or not. Um, you know, it's all types of organized religion kind of lets you participate, but I hope you're seeing that the theme here is that reconciliation comes only through Christ. Uh, it's not going to come through the law of Moses or our own law or anything we could make up or modify or anything. So I, I hope that's one thing that's going to come through to us. Let's... Um, Turn to Ephesians. Let's just start in chapter 1. I'm just going to read a few verses, 3 through 14. Again, I encourage you to soak this in in its fullness. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on his beloved. Again, this idea of love, you know, this is part of what we need to, to really see about God, <coughs> is what, he loved us this much to do this much for us. Kind of incomprehensible, really, because it's, we just, talk about it over and over and over and and maybe a lot of us feel we need to you know build our religion past the simple points of grace and forgiveness and redemption but if Peter and Paul and those guys could talk about it for so many years after it happened to them I kind of question why we feel we have to get more sophisticated with our religion but, Uh, verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our tra trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things upon the earth in him. Uh, through 14. Also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. I see, again, some themes in here. I see that everything was through Christ. We did not do this ourselves. We didn't um, work. We didn't accomplish. We didn't earn God's love. We didn't uh, repair the rift between us by being super religious or super people or whatever. But we see this theme again of how God loved us. I want us to try to grab a hold of that in the days to come. Um, that should influence us very deeply, I think. Uh, we see the redemption through his blood and forgiveness. You know, this is kind of like I'm saying, I probably personally put a great overview of the concept of grace over all of those things. For some of you, you really break that down. Um, but in verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. So it wasn't according to us, you know, earning that. It was grace. I really like verse 8. He lavished upon us. Mm -hmm. He didn't just cut a deal. He didn't cut his losses. He didn't, you know, do what he had to do. I mean, that's God's attitude towards us. He lavished this on us. Um, why don't we turn to Colossians? I have a couple passages there. right up in chapter 1. Verse 
and I'm just going to read 18 through 23. He is also head of the body, and this is Jesus, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross through him. I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Again, I think these are the things I want us to absorb and think about. Uh, it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross through him. Yeah, you know, I don't think we again, especially I maybe in some cultures they have a little easier time understanding this. You know, one of the things I've often wondered is how did Paul and Timothy and Titus and those guys get uh, leaders of their churches so quick? Because in our culture, you know, we would probably want you to be saved for, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years, prove yourself, you know. To me, it almost doesn't seem like they had that timetable. But if we came out of a culture that maybe didn't try to tell us we were good all the time or something, this change might be a little more uh, significant. I think we get hung up in our culture and we really don't grasp what it's like to be alienated from God. Um, we don't think we are, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, even people who I think I'm kind of referring to like the public sector and politics and stuff, but people who are, are very obviously not following God's word in their decision making and their lifestyle will try to somehow God bless America or, or will pray for you when bad things happen. Uh, you know, we just, we really have trouble with this, I think, as Americans seeing that we were really alienated from God. Mm -hmm. If we had four or five Christians blood stains on our tunics because they splattered a little too much when we were stoning them, you know, we might realize what it was like to have been reconciled to God. Yeah. I think for a lot of us we just we don't think it was that big of a gap. <clears throat> Well, yeah, I guess that's just what I wanted to point out. You know, it was the Father's pleasure, and we were enemies. And and that is what he actually rescued us from. And just kind of steer us back on course a little bit, he actually rescued us from the, an eternity of being separated from him. Let's um, go to Colossians 2 now. I'll read a little out of there as well. <clears throat> Verse 6 through probably 15.
As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Which is a pretty appropriate response. Yeah. <clears throat> See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. And that's what I was saying, all things come through Christ. Very quickly, however, sadly, that doesn't seem sufficient for us, and we begin to be pulled and drawn by these other things a lot of times, and that's why there's this warning here. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried in, with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions, that was our condition, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, and which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. The talk about circumcision maybe is a little complicated. Uh, I wasn't planning on getting into that today, but you know he was obviously dealing with the real circumcision that the Jews go through, and just all the difficulty they had in understanding where they stood now with God and whether to be circumcised or not. And kind of like I stated at the beginning, some had probably good, honest questions and some had ulterior motives perhaps. But he, he's talking about being marked for Christ. And uh, here again we see Just the, the same concept, really, that we the the significance of our situation, and uh, that everything has come through Christ. That uh, He canceled our debt. He uh, he offered us forgiveness through Christ Jesus, the Lord, and it was this is a an expression of God's love to us. He did this because he loved us this much. I want to kind of break here a little bit um, because I think probably we have frankly two groups of people here as in any group. Um, we have those that are have trusted in Jesus and have come to the same realizations of some of the things I'm reading and we have allowed our rap sheet to be nailed on his cross. And so, although this hasn't been a you know, terribly well-spoken sermon, we maybe are being reminded to rejoice in that fact and be influenced by it. And to just renew a pursuit of the love of God for that. Um, and that's the part I want you to be overwhelmed by. You know, I, I don't want you to box it in and just you know, categorize your grace and your mercy and your whatever. That's fine if, if that actually helps you. But I'm going to say, 
real frankly, that if you still bear your rap sheet, guess who it's going to get pinned on? Yeah. It's not pinned on his cross. It gets nailed to someone else. And I want to give you the opportunity to really think about that. Today may be the day that you want Christ to redeem you from your sins. This may be the opportunity for you. Maybe I haven't expressed it terribly well, but this is what I believe that this scripture is telling us. That it's the act, it's through God's love that God sent his son Jesus and it was the act of dying on the cross that gives us all these things. It gives us our righteousness, our salvation. We're not enemies to God anymore. We have peace, or can, we have access to it. For those of us that have allowed Jesus to take our rap sheet, I want to just continue. And this may be of some benefit to all of us, but the reason I feel maybe the unsaved, uh, one trap I see the unsaved maybe going into here is that without being redeemed, we would just try to be religious. We would try to work our way through this. We would try to learn the words and the rhetoric and join a religious group and, and do things. But I hope that God's word has spoken to you well enough to, let, to help you understand that it's only through Jesus that we can be saved. But Jesus gave us a parable, and it's recorded in Matthew chapter 18, if you'd like to join me there. And I would really like us to think about it. I have no idea where you're going to go with this on your own time. If you're going to really kind of renew your commitment to understanding what it cost Jesus to redeem you. Uh, what was really on your rap sheet, what you were really saved from. Uh, if it's going to influence your love and affection for God, just to remember. Let's start in verse 21. I'm in Matthew 18. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I did not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him ten thousand talents. That may possibly be around ten million dollars, but I'm not sure. I read some things that somehow divided it into like 10,000 or 10 million, excuse me, dollars worth of silver, but somehow the actual purchasing power out in society would have even been deemed greater than that. I'm not totally sure what that means, but um, it's a. Uh, it's kind of like losing the lottery, and you owe them. <laughs> that size of an amount that you can never pay them. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me. I will pay you everything. Which is religion. He probably really could have never done that. Maybe in this case, a couple people actually could have repaid the ten million, but most of us, you know, would work our whole life and never actually do it, but we would think we were. We would think we could. <coughs> and the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him his debt. That's what I've been trying to express. 
But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. <clears throat> now it appears that a denarii was about a day's wages, so this is a doable debt. This is about a hundred days' wages. You take quite a hit, but you know you could pay that back. So the slave that was forgiven went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him and began choking him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll repay you. He was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slave saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, <coughs> Excuse me. You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? As his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. So shall my heavenly Father also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. <clears throat> I just wanted to kind of conclude with that because as is obvious to all of you, uh, you know, this, this isn't something I'm particularly good at. Um, I'm not a master of grace. I am also a student of it. And I just kind of feel that my life has been um, turning in a way that I've been trying to reflect on that. And so that's what I wanted to do today. I obviously didn't choose to wear a suit and tie, and it didn't take us two hours, and I don't even know what discombobulationalism is. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to wear my best threadbare clothes and talk from my heart for a little while. And I don't know how it's come off, but I, I am appreciating God more and more in my life. And I wanted to try to share that. And I want us to try to reflect on that. I want us to think about that. Um, I want us to be influenced by it. This is one that, you know, fairly obvious. If someone owes you money, you might think about what the Lord might want. But what about, like, our church involvement? And what about, like, just how we treat each other? You know, I'm a very critical person and a grudge holder. Um, so that's something I have to really work on. I'm kind of thankful that God didn't hold a grudge against me. <laughs> Um, I just, I think we, I want you to consider, I know all of you won't, but I want you to consider going home and reading these passages in your own voice, making it a little easier to hear and understand it. Um, just immerse yourself in what God really did for us. And just kind of get back to the basic of being grateful being thankful. And if you've never done that, you know, I encourage you to consider which side of grace you're on today. Um, as we saw in Colossians there, we all have a rap sheet. You know, we've all done stuff. All have fallen short of the glory of God. That was in Romans. If you want to go back and find it. But I just, I want us to kind of uh, be influenced by the significance of God's grace towards us. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what I think is happening in my life a little bit. And I want it to happen in yours, you know, and I want it to happen here in this church family. So, I think I'll conclude there today. Um, that's really all I had and I can't think and talk very well so it'll go downhill from here if I try, <laughs> to, uh, try too much more. Um, 
Yeah, I just, I thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, I really didn't know what to expect. I had a lot of things in my mind, but I uh, wasn't sure it was going to come out of my mouth too well. So, um, just don't, don't sell God short, you know. There's, uh, you might read some of 1 Peter, you know, because he encourages us to remember some of these things even when there's tribulation and trials. Uh, frankly, I kind of have to suggest that a lot of ours are kind of come upon us because of our own dumb decisions, but, you know, there are countries where uh, following some of what we talked about today will... Uh, get you publicly executed and it's a little different than drama, you know. So, but nonetheless, <clears throat> uh, we do bring a lot of bad things into our lives and, and Peter talks a lot about this too, so. You know. <clears throat> once, we, once we begin to grasp the significance of what we've been forgiven from, I dare say it should influence an awful lot of our life and an awful lot of our relationships, our behavior, our attitudes. It's a process. Uh, you know, we're stinkers. But um, that's what I want us to do. That's what I want us to think about.